Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets, and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. They have a very strong compressive bite. They have the capacity to lacerate your skin and bite parts of you off. Wolves are natural predators, and working with them is not for the faint-hearted. Chris Edrington from Steve Martin's Working Wildlife trains wolves for film and television. We supply animals for the entertainment industry. I used to call it the film industry, but that's sort of antiquated. It's work in front of a camera uh, where someone is paying us to film an animal that's part of content that somebody else is selling. I would say 90% of the work that I personally do is in front of a camera that way. Mark, stay, stay. Good boy. Depending on the economy, sometimes 10% of the work or more will be event related. Uh, America's funny that people have disposable income and somebody occasionally wants a lion at their party or a wolf or a baby animal of some kind. Uh, these are gray or timber wolves and name is interchangeable. They come in different colors, dark like these two or, or gray like the other one who's wandering around. We have one that's sort of a lighter color too. These particular guys, their bloodline is from North America. Chris's most famous animal pupils starred in the iconic movie, Dances with Wolves. The movie's wolf character, Two Socks, was actually played by two different wolves, Buck and Teddy, who looked so similar, only their trainers could tell them apart. Those wolves uh, lived here. The owner actually had to double the actor Kevin Costner for a couple scenes that, where they interacted. This group of wolves here, we've done uh, True Blood, uh, Vampire Diaries, Teen Wolf. We did three seasons of Game of Thrones, and then a bunch of other movies. Captain Card, he's attacked. Chris has worked with a variety of dangerous animals. And while he makes them seem quite safe and friendly, wolves remain wild predators. I've enjoyed everything I work with. I work a little bit with our tiger. It's a solitary animal, and I like it. But I like these guys a lot. They give you love. Uh, all animals show some emotion, but wolves show love more than any other animal. You'd have to be devoid of a consciousness not to see that and see how they show that to you. It's uh, quite wonderful. Hello, my love. Come on. Training wolves is about making the animals familiar with the human world, rather than teaching them clever tricks. Quite frankly, as an animal trainer, I find I don't spend so much time training an animal, but habituating it to the odd things that occur in society. And on a movie set, we have booms and flags and all sorts of things that aren't natural. So we have to get our animals used to that. We have to get them used to loading in a truck or a trailer uh, or whatever cage if we have to go on an airplane. And, and we try to make that so it's, it's normal and not stressful. Going into a pen with wolves is dangerous, 
And no matter how close an owner is to their animals, there will always be a risk. The two uh, black guys here are a part of an older group. When we got them, we had a lot of film projects at the time, and they worked a lot. And we just happened to build a really good rapport. The other wolf, he's just two, and so he hasn't worked quite as much. And I don't have as good a rapport with him as these guys. I can still work with him. If uh, a filmmaker wants to shoot with him, we'll go do whatever we have to. But I, I just, th these guys have known me better and I've done more with them and, and we've traveled more places. And they're older too, so they know that I'm the source of fun more. <laughs> he's a young punk. In a couple more years, he might be standing over here because he knows that the rubs are good and maybe we'll go for a walk out into the universe. Dog trainer and canine behavioral specialist, Michael Chill, is known for his expertise with wolves and wolf behavior. Dogs absolutely evolved from wolves and they share 99.9% .9 of the same genetic makeup. They can interbreed and make fertile offspring. So that's really, from a species perspective, that proves a close relation. Our adult dogs have the similar behavior to a five-month-old wolf. Our adult dogs, our social with strange dogs, typically, are still eager to learn, have a prey drive, but not a serious enough one to really do that much hunting and killing. Our wolves evolve beyond that. Once they become adults, they will accept their own family members, but they're highly aggressive to outside wolves with which they are unfamiliar. Uh, they are quite adept predators. They're highly territorial. So when we then go back to the wild to try to redo this and take a wild animal into captivity, we do not have in a wolf a dog with an exotic look. We have a wild predator. Despite the dangers, extreme animal owners often push the envelope. Hello, baby boy. And not only do R.C. and Sharon Bridges keep a bison as a pet, they also keep and breed wolves and wolf dogs. We do sell our wolves. You know, we have uh, so many people that really enjoy them. And a lot of them, they do make house pets out of them. We have lots of happy customers. And you know, one person said, you can't keep a wolf in the house, and Sharon replied back, we keep a buffalo in our house. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me we can't keep a wolf in the house. Yeah. <laughs> the most worried I was one time, uh, we had wolf puppies. And of course, when they're born, the mamas are real protective. And she come running, and I knew I was fixing to get tore up by her, because she'd been real aggressive toward me ever since she had the puppies. And when she come after me, they grabbed her and threw her on the ground and held her down. And, uh, and then I, she was growling and stuff, but that, anyway, I just, I just backed off and she was fine. Wolves live by a strict and ruthless social order, and owners must establish themselves as the pack leader or risk a vicious alpha challenge. R.C., of course, as the dominant male of the family, he takes charge, and whenever he feels like he's comfortable with me jumping in, because he won't let me jump in and do anything without his okay first. The way we do them, we keep two to three in a pen, and we never have any problem with them. We do have an alpha problem occasionally, and I got rid of a female lately because she was causing too many fights. I raise these guys, and because of how I've worked with them, I think they view me as the top dog. They live in a sort of interesting structure. Biologists tell us that an alpha male and an alpha female will form, and basically what that means is the dominant pair will be the only one that will be allowed to breed. And uh, nature is really cruel. Sometimes the other ones breed, but if they have a successful litter, the alpha male and female will just kill it. The way we raise them, these are very nice, but they, they're still... You can't take the jungle out of the boy. Nature designs them to be a certain way, and they're wild animals. Therein lies the difference between a domestic dog and, and this wolf. Even though this guy is just rolling on his back and rubbing his belly, he's still a dangerous animal. With a bite that can break bones, wolves may look just like exotic dogs, but can they make good pets? I work with them all the time, I see them every day. No, they're horrible pets. 
I would never bring one to my house uh, because I know they would be enthralled by my leather couch and they would perforate it with holes, they would rip up my carpet, they would tear down my blinds. I have faith that they would do that. I might be able to get them not to do that when I'm there, but if I walk away, I have faith that they will completely destroy everything when I'm not there. Conversely, when I've had domestic dogs, I train them so that I could trust them. We've basically trained our wild animals not only to behave, but just to be able to convey safely around society. But uh, yeah, no, the wild animals I work with, I would never recommend as a, having a, as a pet. Well, personally, for me and RC both, uh, for us, I think it's great. But it's, with these kind of animals, it's not meant for just anybody to pick up and say, okay, I want to make them a pet. You have to be really dominant. You have to be their leader. If you're not going to be top charge, then no, then they're not going to be safe for a pet. In spite of the danger, many, including R.C. and Sharon, still believe that a 100-pound predator can make a good house pet. We bring all the wolves in the house. Um, you know, we play with them, take pictures with them. Certain ones we'll let um, the grandkids play with. There's some of them that we won't let the grandkids play with. Ours make a good pet. It just like all animals, depending on how they're raised from beginning, really, is what makes good pets. When I got in the wolf business, I thought I had a mean animal coming to me. And it wound up being the sweetest animal I've ever been around. And we always hear the stories about the big bad wolf. They're just unbelievably a gentle animal. I do think they're dangerous when you let them run in a pack. I find you get what you put out. Conversely, if you have a child, a human, and you put it in a closet and 10 years later open the door, what are you gonna have? Uh, if you have a bear or a lion or a wolf and you raise it appropriately and you get it used to the trappings of humanity and you take it everywhere and you teach it things and you love it, you will have a great animal that's capable of safely operating with other people in human society. Don't let their looks deceive you. Wolves may resemble the family dog, but they are an apex predator, capable of taking down large prey and causing serious physical injury and even death. If you're going to house a wolf and they were able to live in a wilderness area and come back to visit, but they certainly weren't put in a captive situation, that's kind of ideal. My wolves became my wolves because people thought they could turn them into dogs with proper training and found out the hard way, doesn't work. You cannot train a wolf to be a dog. The debate about whether circuses keeping exotic animals in captivity is right or wrong is gathering momentum. And circuses themselves are in a situation where they're having to consider their future and how their life could change. Regardless of your position on the subject, circuses are still traveling from town to town, entertaining enthusiastic audiences. Would that all change if the exotic animals were no longer there? Jan is the matriarch of the Stardust Circus, which tours around Australia with exotic animals as part of the show. Her family has been working with the animals for generations. Really a family affair, the whole circus. There are 28 people on, counting all the babies, of course. This circus is family run, and most of them have grown up working with exotic animals. It's a life they've always known, and they treat their animals as part of their family. It's a pretty good life, really. But what's it like to work in a circus with exotic animals? We have the only two remaining circuses in Australia now with exotic animals, and we have both. We have six lions, five monkeys, and that's all in the way of exotics. The others are pigs, goats, dogs, horses. These animals have been born and bred in captivity, so they don't know any other life. So it's not like they've been plucked from the wild and suddenly they're, you know, living this life. It's not that at all. And people don't seem to understand that. They seem to like the life they've got. I guarantee that. The wild isn't as great as what people make it out to be either. 
In the wild, a lion can live up to 14 years. But at the circus, the lions can live up to 25 years without the stresses that come from living in their natural habitat. Yeah, we treat them like family. They're our, they are our family. When we move to each place, they come first. They're set up before anything else. So to make sure they've got all their comforts of home, the, and even to the point if it's a hot day, the lions have their air conditioners turned on, and if not, they lay out in their yard and snooze all day, and they have a bit of a life of luxury here. <laughs> they don't do any hard work of any sort. And they don't have to worry about where their next meal's coming from. The circus is regularly inspected by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals to ensure they comply with all the necessary regulations. A lot of councils have banned the grounds for exotics because the animal liberationists tell them so many lies about what we do to our animals, which doesn't happen at all. And they can make up some doozies, of, believe me, some of the stories they tell them. And uh, we'd be in jail if we did half of what they tell them. Jan has bred several lions over the life of the circus, which has provided an interesting story to the tax man. We had um, cubs living in a caravan. They had a little bed under, under the table. And uh, I'd say to them, righto, go to bed. So I had some paperwork on the table. And it was, my husband had had the, the tax return sitting on there. Well, it fell down under the table and it, it got all chewed up by the cubs. We had to send it in like it was, put it in with a little note that these were chewed up by lions, you see. And so I was thinking after it, I bet they thought, no, oh, we've heard everything now, every excuse in the book, this, this one will take the cake. Public safety and the safety of the lions is a high priority for the circus. And there's a double fence around the lions area for added protection. We have barricades around and all that, and the lions do get locked away at night. We have security right around them with the caravans, so our own people are there all the time, 24 hours a day. And we very rarely ever have anybody come around that want to get in with the lions. <laughs> uh, if they do, they probably get eaten. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Uh, they'll probably lick them to death. <laughs> the lions can be found lazing about in a large fenced off grassed area to the rear of the big top, oblivious to the debate surrounding them. With social change, circuses are now under intense pressure from animal welfare groups that say it's cruel to keep animals in captivity, that they shouldn't be kept in small cages. This is the uh, cages that they can't turn around in. They're not big enough, aren't they, Glenn? Yeah. <laughs> they can't turn around in these. Cramped up in this, this you. Some of it's funny. If it wasn't so stupid, it'd be funny, but they come out with some weirdo things. These lions have lived like this since they were born at the circus. They have never been in the wild, so this is the only life they know. They are well looked after and safe from other predators and human encroachment to their natural habitat. Matt has worked with the lions since they were cubs, so they have built up an amazing level of trust. He spends up to an hour a day with them, training and the occasional cuddle. You can sense Matt has a special bond with his lions. His partner, Winona, is well aware of the dangers Matt faces every time he goes into the ring with the cats. I feel like he's pretty safe, but it still is a bit of a worry. They are lions, so. You know, you, ne you never really know. Hopefully he's aware at all times of what's going on. So, he's, you know, they do love him, but, you know, sometimes you just never know with animals. Matt has total respect for the lions in his care, and he knows when he enters the training area, there are six lions moving around him. He knows he can never drop his guard around these powerful predators. When you're working with lions, especially if there's more than one in a cage, you need to make sure you know where they all are at all times. Uh, you need to know what, what they're looking at and where, they're, uh, where their focus is on. Their body language is a big thing, so ears twitching and tail twitching, uh, stance, if they're ready to pounce, if they're not ready to pounce, you know, pretty relaxed. So you just got to watch their eyes, their eyes is a big thing. Usually you can tell from their eyes what they're thinking. So he's pretty relaxed, just watching Bart over there at the moment. But they're all pretty good. They all have their own personalities and, and moods and 
Sometimes they're in a good mood and sometimes they're not, and as long as you uh, are paying attention, it's pretty safe. Hello, boys. He's beautiful. There is a lot of trust between the lions and Jan. Putting your hand inside a lion's cage is something that Jan doesn't like recommend. That, I wouldn't let any strangers do that. We know them pretty well and how far you could go with them. If they were in not in a really flash mood, I wouldn't do it, but that's very rare. But now and again, just the other two bigger males will have a bit of a barney with each other about who's going to be the boss of the females. They are beautiful, gentle animals, and you would probably um, trust any animal, no more than about 95%, but uh, they're just like it. So a dog even, who knows if a dog could ever turn. So far, the lions have been relaxed, but there is a change in mood in the training area between two of the males, and we get a glimpse of what lions are capable of. There's always that very, very, very slight chance, very slight. But so far, they, they've been really good. Hey, 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 stop it. <laughs> Oi, stop it. Oi, hey, 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 stop it. Stop it. I have a little barney every now and again. They don't do any damage to each other. Uh, just for something to do, I think. <laughs> After the dust has settled and the brief altercation is over, the victor lies next to the female, while the jilted male looks across. Today, mating season has a winner and a loser. He's a pretty good natured lion hawk is. Very, very calm and relaxed usually. Does not much scares him, so that's always a good thing. Some lions are very jumpy, which makes it hard to work with. Usually if they're like this, it's, it's, it's fine, but it doesn't mean it's gonna stay like that. Something could uh, get their attention out there and they could just run to chase that or, you know, someone could bite him on the bum while I'm playing with him. So I've got to be ready for everything. You right there, buddy? You right there, bud? Hmm? You right there, mister? Hmm? 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 Yeah, you big goofball. You big goofball, hey? Yeah, you big goofball. Not everyone agrees that keeping exotic animals in captivity is good for the animals. But Jan maintains they have a good life and are treated as part of the family. Well, this is their air conditioning unit, so uh, on a very hot day, the air conditioning goes on, so they're, boom, up into there and sprawled out. They've got little ledges and shelves up in there too that they, they sleep on, they like to go high. We hand raise them. They live in Glen's Caravan for the first six months. My wife can't handle the smell. so. Glenn gets the first six months, uh, which is waking up at three in the morning to bottle feed, and, and uh, it's just like having a baby. And then they start tearing up the furniture. And the first uh, probably year we trained out here in the yard just to get all the basics down, like staying on the pedestal and, and stuff like that. So we train out here so anybody can come and watch. Every day it's just playtime in here. Here's just mutual ground, you know, in there I'm the boss, we do the, the jobs, and out here is playtime. So. Kid, 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 kid. It's all reward based so they know what to do and uh, they're always wanting to do it before I ask them to instead of waiting for their turn. So it's, it's, they really want to do it, it's just getting to wait is the hard bit. So they eat out of my hand, uh, usually some nice fresh horse or something. And if they're full they don't want it and if they're too hungry they'll um, take your hand with it. So you've got to sort of keep them at that where the stage where they're not hungry but they're not too full to eat. You can never underestimate the power of one of the largest felines in the world. In the wild, they work together to hunt their prey. Lionesses do most of the hunting for the pride, each having different roles and working together efficiently to bring down their prey, using their vice-like jaw to snap the victim's neck and drag it to the ground. The lions might be the resident stars of the circus, but the rhesus macaque monkeys are another exotic that looks cute at first sight,
but can attack if they don't know you. Oh, it's beautiful boys. He's a beautiful boy. He's a beautiful boy. The two in this cage are the youngest two that we've got. But they don't take kindly to strangers. They're not an animal that um, anyone could get in with or anything. Don't get too close to them. And I'll grab your glasses off. They're a bit naughty. Especially the people they don't know, more so. We have five now. Two of them really love me. The other three, they, they like me, but not as much as the two. <laughs> I have trained Cleo to do hand balancing, so I work Cleo in the show. Some might say it's cruel to make animals perform tricks, but they are never forced to do them. And if they don't want to do it, they'll soon let their trainer know. They do bite. But everyone knows when, they, when they're out, just to make sure they keep away from the people who can't handle them. According to Matt, Reese's macaque monkeys are charismatic, but they also have a vicious streak. So you need to think on your feet when working with them. So you just got to sort of work with whatever they, they're willing to put out. Uh, they have a short attention span also, so you can't work too long with them. So when you're training, you do a couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes there, and they'll tell you when they're fed up, and so you move on to something else. They get bored pretty quick. This is Cleo. She's an 11-year-old Reese's macaque. She's the baby. Uh, the monkeys are good. There's always a, a like an attitude from them, so it gives you something to, to deal with. And they only like a couple of people usually, so they, they get attached to a couple of people and everybody else is sort of, you know, fair game. Cleo here is, uh, she's pretty smart. She knows how to undo the clip on her collar. So it, sometimes in the show when we, just, that we have to, in between tricks, she does just uh, has to wait. And sometimes if you're not watching, she'll unclip herself, go to the table, get a treat, and then uh, head back home, put herself away again. Millie, the, the one in here with, that stays with Cleo, she's got a lot of attitude. She's willing to attack anybody, really. She's just full on. Uh, family more than pets. Yeah, they're part of the family. Uh, yeah, they get all the best of everything. The average macaque can grow up to two feet high and weigh up to 15 pounds. It's a small package, but when aggressive, nasty bites and the risk of disease are consequences of getting too close. Well, they're not really wild, they've been with us their whole life, but there, there is still the instinct in there. Animals don't think like humans, you know, that's where the people go wrong. Animals have their own uh, thought processes and their own and way of doing things, so to us, like something we would think is nice, they think is, is you just letting them do whatever they want. It's showtime and the exotics are preparing to make an appearance to their adoring public there are preparations that need to happen in the ring to make sure everyone is safe. Please welcome here into the steel arena, Star Circus, Australian born and bred, the Falling Lions! Jan and her family enjoy sharing these animals with the public. But today's circuses are finding themselves going through a transition, deciding if they will continue including exotic animals as part of the show or need to bend to the pressures of social change to stop keeping animals in cages. These could be the last of the lions at this circus. They will not be breeding any more of them, so once these unique animals have retired, it is unlikely there will be any bred lions thrilling the audience. Time will tell as to how circuses with exotic animals will evolve under the big top in the years to come. Located in the San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California, the small city of Big Bear Lake is a popular holiday destination. The region draws thousands of tourists and its picturesque surroundings have been used as locations for many Hollywood classics including Daniel Boone, Gone with the Wind, and even Disney's Old Yeller. But Big Bear Lake is also known as the location of a much more shocking filming project. The tranquil mountains of Big Bear are a world away from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. They're also home to the well-known Hollywood animal trainer and stuntman, Randy Miller. 
Randy's company, Predators in Action, specializes in location and studio trained exotic animals. Yeah, I mean, I definitely built Predators in Action with no fear. We still do push the envelope, but back in the day, we really pushed the envelope. And I mean in every way. It could be a stunt doing a staged attack, or even just a simple model shoot with a tiger crawling on a girl that the cat's never seen before. We did things back then we probably wouldn't do today. Drawn to animals from a young age, Randy's family was in the seltzer business, and during the 80s, he helped turn the family business into a $100 million a year company. He lived an extravagant lifestyle and used his successful business fortune to indulge his childhood dream of owning big cats, bears, and other exotic animals. Back in the day, I had great resources to, you know, accommodate these types of animals and to just, just to get the permits and, and permission to have them. Basically have them with me wherever I go. And that's really what I did. We built a house in the Hollywood Hills with a, a three-story glass cage. It was designed, you know, for big exotic animals. I didn't have any animals live there full time. I had a place out in the desert where I kept all my animals and I used to bring them in to visit while I was in Hollywood, just so I could always have my animals around. When the family business went bankrupt, Randy was forced to find another way to both earn a living and keep his dangerous pets. He turned his eccentric hobby into a career and began supplying big cats, grizzly bears, and wolves for big budget Hollywood movies and high rating TV shows. His signature stunt was a staged attack, where his animals staged realistic but harmless attacks. He created a unique and potentially life-threatening product. My staged attack was not taught. Nobody teaches you that. It was developed back in those days, like in that house with that glass cage. I used to wrestle my animals and play with them. I mean, the reason I used to wrestle and play with my animals was because of the joy I got out of it and the fun it was. But the animals bond so much stronger when you have that kind of interaction. They just do. I mean, the key to an animal's heart is to play and have fun. And those lions and tigers, bears, they love to wrestle and play. So I think most of us wrestle and play with younger animals. As they get older, it becomes much more dangerous. My whole stage attack developed out of playing with these animals as they matured and just learning how to control it. Years of high-risk training with ferocious carnivores yielded the ultimate Hollywood payoff. When Miller won a Stunt Academy Award for his role as Russell Crowe's stunt double during the tiger attack scenes in the blockbuster movie, Gladiator. Once I focused on doing film work with these animals and I really focused on training them to be in movies, that's what we were training for was that scene, not even knowing it. But I mean, I would say our whole career put us there. That tiger was raised its whole life to play out all that action you see in that scene. You know, the lunging, the jumping, the snarling, and that staged attack. I got bit on that show. There were a lot of staged attack scenes and they, it required a lot of takes over and over. Attacks from the back, attacks from the front, while filming one of those attack scenes, um, Tara, the tiger I was using, ended up grabbing the wardrobe, which was leather. So she grabbed it, 
and you know she got possessive over it is what happened and she ended up biting she tried to take it from me and she bit through it and put a hole in my arm so at that time they cut and said hey we got it done went undressed got out of wardrobe they they you know they bandaged up my arm and then a PA comes in and says hey the main camera broke. We don't know when it, the film actually broke, so we got to go out and refilm all that. Like the special effects camera. They got me back out there. They put a steel plate over the wound, and we started doing it again. And the only reason I was able to continue doing that attack after getting bit pretty bad was I understood why she bit me. You know, she wasn't really biting me. She didn't go after me out of anger. She went after the wardrobe and got possessive over it. Between 1990 and 2011, there were over 300 incidents involving captive big cats in the U.S. 20 people were killed. Over the same time, captive bears killed six and injured 61. Working alongside predators is never 100% safe for the humans involved. American Humane is responsible for making sure that the work is safe for the animals. Our job is really just to make sure it's done well. We, we're our primary mission is to oversee, basically, police the care, the safety, the humane treatment of the animals while they're on set. The others want to debate whether it's philosophically okay to use these animals. So when I'm asked, you know, should these animals be used, you know, look, we could sit here for three hours, four hours, and, and probably not arrive to a, a decent answer. But when I tell you, look, my job is to make sure that the animals that are participating are being used in these environments, are cared for properly, that is really our job and our mission. Big cats, grizzly bears, and wolves are popular movie stars, and they're all capable of removing human limbs in seconds. Even a monkey can cause serious lacerations and injury. Strict safety protocols are always in place, but when dealing with unpredictable natural predators, safety measures aren't always 100% effective. You know, on the good sets, in my experience, on the controlled film sets that hire the right people who care for their animals, who've had the time, put in the time to train them properly and, and go through all the preventative measures, in instances like that, I think it's very safe. I think it's very controlled and safe. Now, as it often is, it comes down to hiring the right people, right? Getting the right team around you. Because if you get someone who doesn't have the experience, you're gonna be in trouble. One thing with my line of work, we have developed one of the best safety protocols there is. I mean, you need a fast plan if something goes wrong. And, and we all learned, even with that, the ultimate price can get paid. You know, these animals are capable of taking somebody's life in a matter of seconds. So my position, knowing that, anybody handling these animals, not just owning these animals, but working around these animals, should have the education and experience to participate in stopping or helping save somebody's life if there's an accident or an attack taking place. Many exotic pet owners raise their animals from babies, building a strong bond and creating a sense of trust. It can be easy to forget that such majestic and affectionate creatures can also be ruthless killers. There could be a false sense of security there where you feel, where you, you believe it's safer than it really is. Fire department emergency, how can I? Hi, I'm Brian Lynn with the transfer. She's at Onyx Summit. Off of Rainbow Lane. Calm down, off Rainbow Lane. He's bleeding from his neck heavily. Hold on, ma'am. She's at Onyx Summit off of Rainbow Lane. There's a bear, we think it's an animal attack. Okay. Yes, there's a bear attack. A bear attack. Until you've experienced, you know, what can happen, how fast things can change, you don't really have a clue, you know? And unfortunately, it takes a tragic, you know, accident to, to really experience what I'm talking about. A bear attack, okay. He's bleeding heavily from his neck. Okay. We're trying to get him into the car. We need someone here immediately. And you know, you do this long enough. You know, I, I, I know people that have been doing this for generations 
and you talk to guys that have been doing this for a long time, you know, we've all experienced something. In 2008, Randy's cousin, Stefan Miller, was fatally wounded while shooting a promotional video at Randy's Big Bear property. Stevie's co-star and killer was a 700-pound, seven-and-a-half-foot grizzly bear named Rocky. The attack was swift and completely unexpected. We weren't ready for what happened. That's how fast it is. That's how fast it can, it can happen. I mean, if you actually time it, once it started, it was like three and a half seconds. It all happened really fast. So we stopped it, and actually Stevie appeared to be okay. We later learned it was a fatal bite, one single bite. Five-year-old Rocky had been trained to wrestle humans and was best known for his appearance as Dewey the Killer Bear in the 2008 film Semi-Pro. Stevie wanted to wrestle Rocky. You know, he had experience in the past. Rocky was a great candidate for wrestling somebody that, you know, wasn't doing it all the time. The authorities deemed it an accident based on the injuries. They could tell by the injuries what type of attack or bite took place. They ruled it a single bite in, in Rocky's case. Although that single bite left a profound scar on Randy, incredibly, he still lives with and cares for Rocky the bear. A lot of people love animals and say they love animals, but some people, like myself, love them so much they have to be with them. And I think that's the difference, you know? It's easy for somebody to criticize what we do, but they may not have that same desire. I know from experience, I have that desire that's more important to me than anything else, having, keeping my animals, caring for my animals, my animals' welfare. I mean, that's what got me into what I do. You know, it really is. It started out as a hobby, and it turned into a profession. You hear about an animal that attacks somebody that had never, you know, had an incident in the past until that moment, and that was the moment with, with Rocky. Working so closely with these types of animals, owners develop a close relationship with an animal that, in the wild, would see them as prey. Perhaps surprisingly, American Humane's Quan Stewart sees that bond as beneficial for the animals too. This gets into a very big ethical debate, you know, should these exotics be in film? And, you know, if, if you have the right people with the right expertise, it can provide the right long-term care for these animals. Yes, I think it's okay. Uh, a lot of these animals are domesticated at a very young age. They're used to human contact. They enjoy human contact. I mean, there's a reward there, you know, especially with a, a creature that could take your life in a matter of seconds, you know? Maybe part of that starts, you know, from the adrenaline rush you, you get with, with it, but there's a lot more to it than that. There really is. You know, these animals do show affection and exotic cats, I've always said, are the most affectionate creatures on Earth. And they are. They will sit with you for hours showing affection. I mean, they're moody, and that's what makes them dangerous. It's kind of like a dog, you know, where they're very friendly and fun. And it usually takes a while before you see their instincts come out, but eventually they will. And all these animals get possessive and it might be something you didn't see until that moment. And when they get like that, it doesn't matter how much they love you, they'll kill you over, over anything. That's how, that's the, it's just in their instincts. It's, it's just in their DNA. Today, Randy remains close to his collection of unusual and dangerous pets. Seven big cats and several bears, including Rocky. I can tell you this, if you put somebody near one of these animals, there is a chance something could go wrong. There is.